So good evening, everyone. And um, thank you so much for coming to our uh, penultimate event. It was going to be the final event, but we've got a very exciting event actually immediately after this. Um, but this is uh, the last of our sort of um, topic based <laughs> events about and today about uh, being kinder to the planet. Um, so I'm looking forward to a very uh, stimulating and hopefully inspiring discussion this evening. Um, it's nice to see so many of you and some old friends and a lot of people who are new to me. <laughs> um, so uh, my name's David Midgley and I'm one of the um, joint organizers of the Leeds Compassion Festival, the kind of Leeds Kindness Revolution. Um, and um, I am particularly keen, was particularly keen to be involved in the Kindness of Planet Day because that's been one of my main um, activities for about the last 20 years have been um, different forms of activism campaigning on climate change and ecological issues and, and eco-spirituality as well. Um, so, um, I just think this is an incredibly important issue. I'm sure that, that, that most of you, or all of you, presumably if you're here, share that view. Um, and we've got a, um, a, a wide ranging panel of uh, speakers here this evening from different um, organizations within Leeds um, who will speak about their perspective. And then we're gonna open it up for a very um, free ranging discussion. So, um, hold on, speak of you a second, speak and see everybody. <laughs> um, yes, this is a funny thing about Zoom. I'm just, because of the recording, I'm, I'm trying to sort of get uh, speak of you on my screen for, for the people who are, who are speaking at the time. And I realize you, you don't see yourself. So I have to pin my video. <laughs> I'm learning more about Zoom as we go along. So yeah. Um, I was originally going to call this event, uh, you know, clim climate and extinction, uh, because I think that climate change, of course, is crucially important um, and it's a pivotal issue, but it is only part of the ecological crisis that we are facing. It's one dimension, I think, is a better way of putting it. Um, and the other uh, most critical and um, uh, urgent dimension is uh, species extinction, but there are so many others. There is, you know, the soil erosion, uh, overfishing. It's a multi-dimensional crisis that we're facing. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why climate change is in the forefront is because, of course, um, whatever happens with the climate um, impacts on all of those other uh, issues and, and kind of multiplies the effect. So, um, we've been seeing, you know, an increasingly, I have to say, scary picture that's coming from the science, um, and the warnings have been getting louder and stronger. Um, but when we look at the indicators of how um, effective the response has been, um, it seems that we are very, still very close to the so-called business as usual scenario in terms of emissions. Um, and in terms of all of those other indicators. So it's proving to be a real challenge to change the direction of change. Um, I've been working uh, mostly at the city level because uh, I feel that that is a, a level where it's, um, it's easier to get significant change than it is at the national level or international level. And if cities change, then they can change, you know, uh, they can change nations and nations can change the global picture. So I'm very pleased to have uh, this evening, you know, four local activists um, with different kinds of organizations. Um, and I'm also especially pleased, with, we have three people who are kind of, of, I think mainly focused on climate, but um, Rahana is is mainly looking at the, the you know the um, concerned with the problem of 
other species and especially animal species. Of course, plant species are also very important, but it's not only the fact that this, we're losing the animal species, but the suffering that they are undergoing as a result of, of the way that we're um, interacting with the natural world and with, with other species. Um, so I want to include that in the conversation as well, very much. Um, and I want to, um, yeah, I want to encourage us to look, no, we, we need to look the, the danger in the face. Um, and many people are not will, so willing to do that because it's, it can seem hopeless. And, and if it's hopeless, what's the point of distressing myself by looking at it? And I really think we need to get beyond that. And I, uh, I'm going to try to, you know, um, explore in this conversation both sides. Yes, it's very serious. Um, it's potentially quite scary. But there are, there is another side. There is there, there there are signs of, I think there are signs of deep change that are happening, um, beginning to happen. And I want to, you know, I want there to be an upside to this conversation as well as a downside. And really the reason we're having this conversation is that we want to be part of um, a process that is triggering a state shift, if you like, in uh, this city's response to climate change, extinction, and all of the other ecological problems that we're facing. And that I think, you know, well, we have a chance of, um, really creating change at that level if we believe in what we're doing and if we um, you know take the steps and um, get the word through <laughs> so I want to hear from the, the panel first and I'm, I'd like to give the panel each about five minutes just to introduce themselves and um, speak a little bit about uh, your perspective, how you see um, the situation, both in terms of uh, the global perspective on, on the ecological crisis and also um, what's happening in Leeds. And I just want to have some questions that I've, I, I've uh, written down and I realize because we're recording, <laughs> if I go to those questions, you'll probably, uh, uh, you might, I don't know, you'll probably still see me on the recording. But anyway, I'm going to read the questions out. Um, so the first question I want to put to the panel is, you know, I've talked about optimism and pessimism, and that's a, that's a conversation that gets rehearsed a lot in, in terms of climate, but I want to frame a slightly different question, and that is how optimistic are you that Leeds as a city could put in place the measures that are needed to be fully ecologically sustainable? That's part one of the question. And part two is how optimistic are you that this would inspire other cities in the UK and elsewhere to do the same? So I think I'm going to start with that question and put that to each of the panel in turn. And could I start? Um, yeah, could I start with Judith Smith from Extinction Rebellion? I need to unmute yourself. I think can't Judith. Hear you. we can't hear you. Uh, do you, do you want us to introduce ourselves? And, yes, please, and then please, please introduce yourself and yeah. say a bit about your perspective on that question and also about the actions that you're involved in and, and your organization yeah. and, and why you are involved with that organization. Yeah, sure. So, so, um, so my name's Judith Smith. Um, I'm a scientist, a professor of biology. I've worked in science for, you know, Nearly, nearly 40 years and the science that I've worked with has been you know myself and my peers we've generated a lot of the data that has looked at biodiversity over time um, and, and it is sort of tragic that you know as the science has become more powerful we've just got you know more and more detailed information about the loss but the pattern has been the same for the whole of that 30 years that we've known there's been biodiversity loss and I've seen successive government scientists lobbying the government about this question and saying how important it is. And I think the frustration is, you know, that we have all the data and we've sponsored a lot of research that, that helps us to think about how we might mitigate climate change, how we might mitigate biodiversity loss, how we might use the land in a more appropriate uh, manner. 
And so there's no shortage of information and no shortage of effort into analyzing this problem, but there's a shortage, there's a deficit in action in the government. And I think that drove me really to become a member of Extinction Rebellion when, it, when XR started, myself and many of my peers as scientists decided we had to step out of the comfort zone of being a, a policy advisor and actually become a lobbyist and say, you know, time is getting very short now. Um, I don't know if you know, but there's a report that came out, the World, the World Wildlife Fund report came out uh, this week. And what it says is since 1970 um, to 2016, uh, we lost 68% species abundance globally. 68%, nearly 70% of species. So this is not news to me. I've been looking at this for years and years, but what's changed for me is I really think that we must act now. We are at a tipping point where things are becoming very critical. So that's taken me into a political arena out of a comfort zone. How would I relate this to Leeds and, and where we are with the government, where we are globally? I think Leeds is, is absolutely in the same place as, as our current government and many global governments. Um, I, don't, I think they are out of denial. Leeds has done some good things. Um, it has set up a climate commission. Uh, it has set up a citizen's jury. Uh, it has a carbon roadmap. It's done positive things. But I would challenge them to put a time scale on these things because when you look at the aspirations, what we find is they are quite vague. There are very few metrics. There's no actual measurable time scale for improvement. Uh, and that's really how I feel um, about where policy is at the moment, that we need to get to metrics. We have a lot of solutions. We have a lot of data, but we're not actually implementing and moving things on. So, Yes, I think Leeds, Leeds sees itself as being a green city. It has done lots of positive things, but I'm, I'm not seeing it necessarily living up to those, um, uh, uh, you know, to those aspirations. Um, and therefore, you know, can it be an example to other cities? We can look around the world, we can say maybe Copenhagen is a, an example. We can pick another city and say maybe it's an example. But the point is we're all behind. Every, we have a long, long way to go. And so we need to move from denial where we have been. Where we are now, I think, is climate delay. That we know what we need to do, but we're uh, apprehensive about change. And therefore, we're just really in a delay phase. And that's where we need, need to get out of. We need to get into movement, movement forward and creating a new future, um, a new, greener, fairer way of living. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very succinct and to the point. <laughs> um, and I think it, um, it would make sense actually for me to pass now to Matt Carmichael, for, who's a member of the Climate Commission. Um, and maybe you can tell us a bit about how you see um, the challenge of if there is, you know, work to be done and moving the, the, the city council and the, the big structures of the city um, much further in the direction of immediate action and, and how you think the Climate Commission might help in that um, and anything else you have to offer. Matt, yeah. please, yeah. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Matt Carmichael. Um, I've been campaigning on climate change in Leeds for about 15 years now, and I'm also a teacher at Round Hay School. So, in the last few years, couple of years really, since um, the, uh, the whole atmosphere has changed really. I think mainly because of the youth strikes in Leeds. Um, um, I've moved much more into looking at what needs to be done in schools and in the education system and that's sort of my focus now. So that's what I spend my time doing with Leeds Climate Commission and I'm also involved with Our Future Leeds. We have a group there called Our Future Leeds Schools um so you know the qu the question about um you know the 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 likelihood of leeds um doing what it takes and then leeds's influence i think it's going to depend very much on um how the public is engaged with this whole issue and uh, the good news is that um 
the Leeds Climate Commission, both the Leeds Climate Commission and our future Leeds, which has recently received some funding through a lottery project, are going to make this a, a really big focus of their work. So I think absolutely rightly, um, councillors who may well have good intentions, their, their, their nerves, uh, the their sort of reason for their hesitance really is about getting the support of the public. Because if you impose big changes on people, whether it's you know their, their heating systems or the transport system, without consulting, without their buy-in, then you get a backlash and you, you can end up two steps further back than where you started. I think we've seen that sort of thing happening in Australia. We've seen it happening in France. So we have to take that issue seriously and we have to move beyond the usual middle-class white suspects who are involved in all these movements. We have to get out to every corner of Leeds. We have to engage everybody in the city in these issues. And however successful that work is, will determine how successful the wider project is uh, and how far Leeds as a city can go in making this rapid transformation that we desperately need. Um, so that's what it depends on, if you said to me. So, that, so that's the straight answer to your question, David. I do mm -hmm. want to say another thing, though, which is as somebody who's, who's been campaigning and devoting a lot of my life to this for, for you know, a, a long time now, um, optimism, optimistic is one of my very least favourite words. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have completely lost interest in the odds. I am not interested... I'm not motivated by some kind of wager on what kind of outcome we're going to get. I'm motivated, uh, and this is why I'm so um, keen on, on and delighted that you've put this particular session on um, this event this evening, because my motivations are about the fact that, you know, I love this planet that we live on. I, um, I love my children. I, I love the, the kids that I work for in school and my colleagues and my friends, this is the motive, right? This is, it's not about, you know, trying to, trying to guess if we're going to win or lose or how far we'll get down this line. The right things to do are the right things to do anyway. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Matt. Very true. I've just been hearing that same message, actually, from, uh, I've just come off us another event, which, which was um, uh, an eco dharma uh, session with a guy called David Loy, who wrote a book of the same title. So that means it's a it was a um, the eco dharma network is a part of a network of Buddhist organisations, and um, that's something I'm heavily involved in. I'm actually about to start teaching a course on eco dharma, which is really about um, the relevance of our internal dialogue, if you like, our internal process, our relationship to the question of the ecological crisis. Um, so, you know, not looking so much at the specific interventions and the details of the, the practical solutions, but it seems we need some kind of shift in consciousness um, to get where we need to go. And that's why, you know, as I've been involved in activist uh, movements of one kind or another for about 40 years i've also been involved in spiritual practice within the buddhist tradition because that seems to me to be very much the heart of the matter so i completely agree matt it was the wrong question <laughs> well, not no, about it's a question but <laughs> bear that in mind yeah don't we? yeah, yeah. My, well, I mean, the my, question experience is meant... the, my experience is on this sort of emotional roller coaster ride of, of sometimes feeling optimistic, then, then the depths of despair when you think, and you, you, you can't sustain that for, for long. You have to find a, a deeper motive than, than just hoping you're going to win. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been through quiet processes with recently and been up here and down there and eventually I realized, well, we don't know, we really don't know, we really, really don't know. We don't know that it is going to be a, a catastrophe. We don't know that everything's going to be okay. We just don't know one way or the other. Yeah. So um, somebody's asked for a link. I will put a link in the chat in 
in a moment about the eco dharma. But I'd like to pass on now to Rahana, if we can hear from you, please, um, about your work as an animal rights activist. And I know that uh, you know you've worked with various organisations, and maybe you're in transition between <laughs> different ones. So maybe you could tell us a bit about that, and um, you know. Um, Let's hear the, 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 that voice as well, because I think that's an incredibly important voice. They, they get forgotten to the animals far too much. Are you there, Ahana? I am, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Great, thank my, you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, evening, everyone. My name is Rihanna Jameen. Um, I'm an animal rights campaigner. I've been a vegan for six years now and active in the animal rights field for about four years. Um, I was with the SAVE movement for three and a half years, um, and I'm now with Freedom for Animals. We do work mainly with animals in captivity, so animals who are used um, in, in, like, for entertainment purposes. Um, I often feel, as a vegan in the environmental sphere, that my perspective or the vegan perspective isn't so welcome, but I think it's really important to, to kind of focus not just on an individual perspective but to look how we, we really need system change here so while we can make small incremental changes in how we live and eat in terms of consuming animal products and those choices that we make we do need the government to be doing things to make this easier for us so a shift to a plant-based food system to make those food choices more accessible to different kinds of people so that being vegan isn't seen as this largely white middle class arena that it is accessible for all races classes i think that's really 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 important i think um we can be doing individual things definitely um and you know my perspective as an animal rights campaigner is to bring forward that these these small changes we can make do make a really big, big difference overall in terms of the environment, the impact, the, our carbon footprint. And so making changes in our everyday lives that seem small, I think sometimes making changes to how we and the way we live in terms of food choices can feel like a sacrifice, a really, really big sacrifice. But we're at this turning point now where, you know, choosing not to eat cheese different dairy products, not to eat animals. David, you mentioned earlier about overfishing. I actually never call it overfishing. I just call it fishing. Um, because any amount of fish we take from the ocean now is too many. We shouldn't be taking any fish from the ocean. We are literally taking so, so much from the earth and we we shouldn't be. It's, it's far, far too much. So. My perspective is that we need to be making these individual changes, sure. And I think it's important to empower people and, and motivate people to make those decisions, to make these choices more accessible to more types of people, but also that we do need the change to come from the government. So it's not just our, our individual changes. And um, yeah, that's... Thanks very much, Rahana. And I just have a little follow-up question on that. I wonder if you think that there is um, useful things that could be done at the city level. Could we, like, uh, you know, could, could, could Leeds potentially become known as a especially vegan-friendly city? What could we do at the, locally that would, uh, you know, uh, and I'm a passionate uh, vegan myself and, and, and animal, you know, uh, liberation person um so uh yeah any thoughts on on specifically more at the local level you know i think a lot of the time with something like like veganism is you know people are busy and they have families and they're working and so i think a lot of the time it's about convenience and accessibility so i wonder if um if there could be some kind of way we could make recipes accessible make make people see that these switches are actually very easy that you know you're not going to become protein deficient if you remove certain things from your diet that you can replace protein with lentils and chickpeas and different beans that 
you know, you can actually save money. I, I think a lot of the time, because people are busy, it, you know, making a change like in the way we eat, it feels like too much. If people have families and they're working full time, it's, it, I think it's not a priority for people. So I think I'd like to see leads, um, yeah, maybe educating and putting, putting on some events, putting um, some speakers in place. Um, I think a lot of the time uh, with anything to do with the environment, I, f I feel as a vegan that diet and kind of these lifestyle changes that people can make are not talked about. And, and it also feels a little bit like a dirty topic or like it's not very welcome, should I say, mm. to, to talk about it. I feel definitely some sort of hostility sometimes, unfortunately. Um, and I think that really needs to shift. Um, and this doesn't come from a place of judgment for people who aren't vegan. I'm really, really happy to speak to non-vegans. Like I, I want to learn about how I can be better at this and how I can become a better advocate. And um, so I think I'd like to see, yeah, if, if it's, I mean, I say events, but I don't know how possible that is now because of COVID and everything. Um, but, but spaces where we can share information, where we can share things like recipes and, um, I mean, I can think of some uh, websites, for example, like Ch Challenge 22 as one, where you can sign up and you get a mentor that helps you through becoming, the, like the stages of becoming a vegan. So if you have questions, like diet related questions, if you, if you want recipe suggestions, et cetera, you kind of get helped and, and talk through. And um, so I think people need support to make these sorts of changes. So I wonder if leads can provide that kind of support for people. Thanks. Those are great suggestions. And, uh, you know, we'll see if we can try and follow up on some of those. Um, I, I do want to say, you know, with regards to the festival in general, it doesn't finish tonight. You know, we, we, we planned a week of events, but there are events continuing and the organisation behind it, um, which is called Compassion and Wellbeing 2020. We will certainly be, be staging another festival this year, but in between, we will be continuing our work. Um, and, and I would like to see us do some events around around the uh, veganism and, and related issues. So thank you so much, Rahana. Um, and we'll come back to you, but um, I would just like to call on Shannon Jackson now for, to speak, tell us about the school strike movement and um, just give us a bit more of the perspective of the, the next generation on these issues. So Shannon, are you there? Hopefully, can, uh, can everyone hear me? If you can, uh, a thumbs up or a wave would be fab. Um, great, okay. I've got 75% of the room. Um, yeah, no, um, thank you for uh, inviting me, David. Um, yeah, so I've been part of um, the Leeds Youth Strike for Climate movement um, since it began last year. Worked with, uh, with Matt and Judith as well. Um, and uh, finally met David, which is fab. Um, I'm also, just in terms of uh, background, I have a, a master's in urban sustainability um so i've got a bit of background as well in terms of like transition um and uh yeah i think definitely echoing the the focus on the importance of cities to take action um and what david was saying around um there's a lot more flexibility and opportunity here um i think the the world uh, of urban of urbanizing um has presented lots of uh, great ways to act um and the really excited by this event and, and being invited to it just in terms of um, the thing that brought me to the environmental movement was uh, working with uh, asylum seekers um, in the UK immigration system um, and very much uh, seeing the, the fallout of um, climate, climate breakdown um, across the globe. And uh, the thing that drove me to into activism was definitely this kind of emotional reaction, this compassion, this uh, what Matt was saying around there is um, there is no right or wrong here. It's just you have to act. And um, yeah, so very excited to be here um, in terms of responding to uh, what like, kind of what I think about about leaders action so far. Um, complicated, um, I think. Uh, so the, the school strike movement, the kind of tagline, the, the message, the push of what we're going for is about climate justice. Um, and I uh, was really excited to see in this event that that was kind of echoed. So this idea of we're not only um, trying to save the planet, but we're actually trying to increase the well-being of all um, 
within that um, and to promote social justice for, for everyone. Um, I guess my, my reflections on where we're at as a city um, is um, I think that we need to critically assess a bit more about when, who we're talking about when we say well-being to all. I think at the minute um, we're not recognising that this is a global uh, issue. We're not recognising it's a global struggle together. Um, in particular, uh, the, the City Council has rejected the Racial Justice Network's uh, recommendation for um, the 13th. So they did, uh, the Citizens Jury did 12 recommendations for what the city needs to be. Um, and there was a 13th one that was provided by the Racial Justice Network about the city as it transitions has to have the global perspective in mind. So for example, if we promote solar panels in this city, we need to be very much aware and acting to counter that we are also promoting uh, things like mining and child labour abroad. Um, and I think at the minute, the, the Citizens Jury um, and the, the City Council have not taken that on board. Um, and I think that, yeah, so I think there are some slight concerns there around how much are we actually embedding climate justice into this. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of my, my concerns at the minute. And I think that has to be global. Um, and I think once you open up to that perspective, um, it provides a whole range of different actions about what climate action means. So it's not just about, you know, um, you mentioned in, in David about fishing and, and soil erosion, it's great to see the focus on biodiversity as well as climate, but there are also other issues here, such as the immigration system, the asylum system, uh, the prison industrial complex. There are um, all of these uh, networks that are tied to, um, to, to action here, to, to bettering social justice at the same time as transitioning. And I think that's why we're finding it really hard to, to get beyond our white middle class network um, because we're not speaking to people about things that are relevant. Um, if you're if you're black and living in the UK, or if you're black and living abroad, um, you know it's very hard to care to care about climate when the the police are going to stand on your neck and and kill you. And that is the reality, I think. Um, so I think the movement is a bit disconnected from where we need to be at. Um, and I think if we took a a greater focus on looking at climate justice and the global perspective, um, we would. Uh, and, and starting that from a city approach, really embedding that into our city action um, and spreading compassion globally. Uh, I think we would make, um, yeah, a lot more headway. And I think it could be a pioneering city for um, not only the, the UK, but the rest of the world. I think it's, yeah, we need to reflect. I, do, um, I would just slightly challenge um, what, what Judith said and full, full respect to Judith. She's wonderful and amazing and a great scientist. Um, but, um, just on the on the point that was made about we know we know what what we're doing um and and we're just in a delay um i would i would challenge that and say um i think actually we need to be doing far more listening from the rest of the world um from different communities that aren't involved right now um and i think that that lack of listening um and that lack of shared ownership about the climate climate agenda um is is uh, delaying um and um, yeah, mean, mean that we're not getting that engagement that we need um, here in Leeds, but also internationally as well. Thank you very much. Um, that I mean, I think that's just an incredibly important point, or well, more than a point, isn't it? It's like a a whole dimension of things that 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 you brought up. Um, and I wonder if you've got any thoughts on um, what what could be done to um, bring that perspective more consistently into policy making, into all the conversations around, um, you know, climate change and ecology, that um, this, this dimension of social justice and global justice um, has, to, um, has to inform all those conversations right from the get go. Um, in this city, what could we do to make sure that that perspective gets heard, do you think? Um, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really big question. I think um, I don't have any, uh, you know, X, X, Y, Z answers, but I think the, the, 
So, for example, at the minute with the um, the lottery funding bid that's just been won, it's a fantastic five year project around the um, citizens uh, and our future leads responding to the climate emergency. And within that, it's really positive to see that one of the goals they've outlined is climate justice. Um, but I guess the, the the point I would know and, and the hesitation or the worry that I would have is that at the minute, and, and this isn't just with that particular project, but I think in general, when we talk about climate justice and um, creating more justice for people at the same time as tackling the climate emergency, uh, it's laid out as one goal among many. Mm -hmm. And I think that means that it's very likely that uh, if we have a choice over, um, do we save more carbon on this or do we try and push for climate justice, you might lose uh, the justice focus. I think actually what we need to do is take a step back and think, how do we embed um, this idea of more justice for people as not just one goal among many, but ultimately the red line which we will not cross. And I think that's really important because playing, um, responding to what Matt was saying um, around kind of giving up on optimism and pessimism about whether we'll do it or not, I really do think I completely share that. Um, and I, I attended a talk in Brussels by one of the leading scientists in the world who said, we have to act as if we're not going to do it because it's really, really hard. Um, and, and I think actually once you open up that space to think about not what do we need to do to meet our carbon target, which is a very narrow focus and puts a lot of people, um, you know, even if we meet the Paris Agreement 1.5, that's heating that a lot of the world cannot cope with. That is mass migration. That, is, that means disaster for so many people. Um, and I think rather than saying, how do we get there in terms of meeting those targets, um, actually going off kind of what Matt was saying, um, you know, just doing the right thing um, and, and thinking about how do we achieve justice within this situation, whether it's talking about how do we transition our energy or how do we transition our housing and the question not being about how much carbon does this save, but actually how do we better the lives of everyone involved and extend that compassion, extend that love, not only to people in Leeds, but also to people globally. How do we transition our housing in Leeds so that we have positive impact here on the people, but also internationally? That's a very different question. And I think it's a much more exciting one. Um, it's, I just, I think it, it's, it's one that we're not asking at the minute and, and one that we should be. So I think to, re to get back to your question, David, apologies, um, it would be, instead of thinking of climate justice um, as one goal among many, um, where it could potentially be lost in this focus to try and meet targets, um, I think we have to have it as a red line that we're not going to um, compensate on. And, and we have to start from how do we achieve justice here and, and that not be something that we're going to, um, yeah, compensate on at all. So a starting point. Thank you. I just want to say I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> so important. You know, let's not forget that. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon. Um, okay, uh, I'm maybe going to do another quick round of questions to the panel and then we'll open it all up um, to everyone. Um, so next question um, is to, to and, and any of you can pick it up. Um, what would you say to people who feel that their individual contribution is too small to make a difference? and that they don't have any influence over the power structures that decide the policies that are creating the problems. Any volunteers <laughs> from the panel? Yeah, Judith. Yeah, I'll volunteer to say something. I mean, I think we all feel like that, don't we? We all feel very small in the face of this problem and you know Greta's called it an existential threat you know that means it self-defines its itself as you know something we can't deal with something we can't fully comprehend so um I suppose what I'd say about it is you know uh, we're, we're you know it's the sum of all of our individual actions that matters you know that the people have power when they act together so I think you just have to be brave enough to say what you think to actually say what you think um and um and to step out um uh, and, uh, and act and as soon as you do that you find you have peers you have other people who agree with you um and there's a danger i think in the in the face of the threat that that you shrink back and you don't say anything 
and the consensus is hidden. So I think, you know, speak out um, and, uh, and we do have power and we, we will have power. And, and you can see how the agenda is moving along slowly, not as fast as I want, not as far as I want. And I'm sure for other activists, they feel the same, but I do feel there is change over time. Yeah, thanks very much. I think that, that is a great point. It's speak out. And I, I don't know how, how many of you saw, um, there's an interview that I saw recently um, by Jem Bandel, who's the founder of the, the Deep Adaptation uh, Network. Um, and it was with um, a girl called Elsie Luna, who's 11 years old. And um, she looks set to be sort of toppling Greta Thunberg <laughs> <laughs> her throne as the queen of the, the youth climate movement. Um, and she, um, she was on the Extinction Rebellion uh, action, I think last November, and um, it was sheeting down with rain and she was standing for, I don't know, about two and a half hours, I think, outside the headquarters of Barclays Bank, you know, to uh, and, and, and insisting on speaking to one of the executives there. And, you know, they finally, she managed to persuade them to send somebody out and she, you know, asking the question, you know, why are you not, you know, pulling out of these unsustainable investments that are destroying the planet? Um, and then she went to another bank, I forget which ones they were, but the second bank, and then they wouldn't let her in. And she said, well, the other bank let me <laughs> send somebody <laughs> to speak to me and they had to send somebody out. So there's <laughs> one person, you know, just having the courage to speak out. And yeah, I think that's really, really key. Thank you so much. But anybody else, any other panelists like to pick up on that point? And in a moment, I'm going to hand over to the rest of the participants. Anybody like to say anything about that? Well, well part of me wants to say to, you know, somebody who, who thinks, you know, uh, it, it's all a huge problem and little, little individual actions don't make much, much difference. Part of me wants to say, you know, congratulations, you know, you've worked out that if we all do our own separate little individual things, then it won't make an awful lot of difference. That these are huge systemic problems. Um, you know, there's lots of things people already said, the, the whole thing about um, climate justice, um, you know, solving the problem of climate change and, and the ecological crisis would be so much easier if we lived in a fairer society in a fairer world um, where the the burden would be shared out more equally and the benefits would accrue more levelly. Um, so the things can't be separated out and if we really want to make a difference we're going to have to work with other people in groups on the on the big system changes as well as the the, the private individual actions um, and then I guess the other thing I want to say to people is what have you tried, you know, <laughs> um, you, if, if the things you tried uh, don't feel like they're making much difference, then try something else, you know. <laughs> 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 and, you know, this is the great thing, I think, perhaps about the way the movement's changing and learning and evolving all the time. You know, pe people are learning from this. And of course, we all make big mistakes um, and movements make big mistakes. Um, but, you know, so long as we're learning and we're, we're, we're thinking what really works and what's effective, um, then, you know, we, we'll, we'll improve in terms of how effective we are as well. Great. Thank you, Matt. And um, just one more question, um, which just picks up on that point, which was, uh, and for anybody on the panel, what would you say are the two or three most effective things David, your, your volume went then, apologies. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. Are you, are you covering your microphone, David? Or? I might oh, be. there you are, you're better there. there okay, hear you again now. Ah, okay, good, thank you for that little tip. <laughs> okay, I'll just read that again. What would you say are the two or three most effective things individuals can do to contribute to a positive outcome of the ecological crisis we're facing? Anybody like to pick up that one? Yeah, Shannon. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the two that popped into my uh, head straight away um, were uh, firstly uh, supporting and uh, giving your voice, your power, your time, 
uh, your resources to um, both the movement for indigenous rights, um, indigenous communities rights across the world. Um, they protect uh, it's about 60% of the, the biodiversity um, that, is, that we currently still have. Um, and so if, if we want to protect ecosystems, um, we have to protect the, the rights of indigenous communities um, to, to have their land. Um, and to, to have ownership over it and um, ultimately for us uh, to not go in and, and destroy that. So um, that would be one, and that's a, that's a big problem right now, particularly in South America uh, and in Brazil. Um, so I would say that would be, that'd be my first call. Uh, the second one would be giving um, your voice, your time, your resources, uh, and also um, your learning to support in Black Lives right now. Um, one of the legacies of colonialism is that we do not uh, use the right language when we're talking about uh, other parts of the world. Um, but the reality is that um, black and brown people make up the majority of people on this planet. Um, and there's huge reframings around, um, around that in kind of the racial conversation. Um, so instead of referring to the global South, referring to it as the majority world as it, as it rightly is. Um, and I think, if we actually want to um, to make progress on, on what is a global issue, uh, then we have to support um, the right of black and brown people to have life um, and, and institutionally uh, across, um, across multiple sectors and, and multiple ways that that's being challenged because if we can, if we can help protect um, and value black and brown lives, then um, we've got the majority of the world that um, is then more ready to 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 get involved, um, and ultimately that are fighting on this on this front anyway. Um, so they they'd be my um, my my two things. And just on that, um, I've just shared a, a link in the chat, just in reference to David's point about uh, another um, youth uh, youth striker um, or youth ambassador for the movement. One of the the problems is that um, Greta often gets all of the focus for starting the school strike movement but actually um, there is a girl uh, Vanessa uh, Nakate who um, was striking outside the African parliament much much further back than Greta so just in terms of unlearning our uh, Eurocentric focus um, just thought I'd share that in there but thank you. Yeah thanks for very much and you know, that was really powerful again so I think it's just underscoring this point um, we must not separate uh, the, 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 those two issues as if um, climate change was a problem for the, you know, the, the, the wealthy white world. It's, it's much more of a problem for the majority world. And, you know, the, the, um, unless we keep that in mind, we, 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 we can't really think in a balanced way about, about how we're going to move forward. So, so thanks again for such a powerful and clear statement of that, Shannon. Okay, um, anybody, what, uh, what, one more response to that? Uh, and then we'll move, we'll move to just opening it up to everyone. Uh, Rahan, have you, would you want to uh, offer us anything on that question? What are the yeah, most um, things people can do? I really, really agree and echo what um, Shannon's just said. And I think within the environmental sphere, it doesn't really go unnoticed that within the UK, you know, a, when you go to any kind of climate event, the majority of the people who are there are white and middle class, especially at XR events. Um, and I mean, other environmental events too. And um, yeah, Shannon mentioned this earlier as well, but you know, that is because black and brown people have to worry about police brutality. And so I think until we're doing something about that as a problem and, and kind of confronting that issue, and it, and it being systemic, we're not going to get other types of people involved. We're not going to really get other voices. So it's really, really imperative that we're all thinking about that. And I, and I think as a whole, when it, it because the, the environmental sphere is so white, it, it, it can feel very safe to go to an event and be involved in something like XR where the approach is that everyone gets arrested and that's okay. Cause it is really okay to get arrested if you're a white middle-class person. Um, so yeah, I, re I really, really agree and just, um, I think what Shannon says is really, really powerful. 
is that you know everything in the climate sphere is is really really closely interwo interwoven with racism and, and anti-racist work is just imperative to what we're doing um, a second thing for me would be to think about individual changes that you can make in terms of you know i don't want to i don't want to kind of reduce it to you know just just be vegan but think about you know what what you're consuming definitely but not only in terms of the food choices but in terms of you know how you're traveling in terms of plastic in terms of all those changes that we can make so if you have a garden and you're composting and um, so not only just animal products but there's lots of lots of things we can do um, and I, I mentioned that because I think it's important that people feel empowered that we can make these everyday changes and um, you know we don't have to be kind of waking up and saving the world every day or feeling like we have to be doing that because then it's overwhelming and then I think we get then caught into this like sense of hopelessness that we can't do it, do it anything and so it's kind of it's really important to feel like we are making progress or we are doing things for me at least that's that's how i feel um yeah thank you great thank you very much um oh shannon yes please yeah sorry baby just really quick on that um i just uh, was thinking um that uh, what rohana was saying i think provides a really uh useful kind of short case of like how important it is to have and also like a positive of, of what I've been saying so I don't want to bring all doom and gloom um in terms of uh the importance of having a global perspective uh just two points um so the 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 client movement here in the UK is very white and middle class but the client movement internationally is not um kind of frontline uh on this um are, are black and brown people um so and and just wanted to to note that and the second thing was um, the importance of the global perspective, I think, is really, uh, yeah, it's really, uh, veganism is a great case study for it in the sense of uh, the answer isn't as simple as, as going vegan, even if we're talking about if that's an accessible option for you in your diet. Um, the, the, there's a lot of criticisms of the vegan movement right now. I was talking with people um, from Colombia just the other day about how, you know, a lot of the kind of um, powders that people use in their smoothies and uh, berries and a lot of the vegan alternatives that come into Leeds cafes are being extracted from communities uh, in, in Colombia, in South America and completely taken uh, from that and changing the meaning of what uh, those foods are um, and then bringing it for, for the vegan movement here. And there's a lot of talk in the race debate about how veganism has uh, essentially co-opted uh, the diet of, of you know, countries like India, that which have for centuries been vegan, um, and uh, and now kind of we've you know taken it and, and changed it and um, and made it something which is inaccessible um, for a lot of people. Um, so I just think it's really important um, as a case, you know, if we start from a global perspective and critically assess something like veganism is is one of the options, which it absolutely is for not for everyone, but it is one of the the options. Um, the need to have a global perspective within that so that we are not just taking, we're not just doing what we have done um, since since the days of colonialism and extracting from the rest of the world. Um, but we're actually stopping that pattern and thinking better and thinking how do we localise, how do we um, be vegan, but in, in a different way as well. Yeah, so... Uh... Yeah, localism very important, obviously. Um, and uh, we had actually, yes, earlier today, we had some quite interesting uh, events, well, an interesting event this morning about local food strategy in Leeds. There seems to be a lot of good things going on there. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not just a matter of not eating meat. We have to think um, sort of systemically and holistically about, about what we eat. And it's incredibly important, I think. Um, yeah. I recently realized I'm, I'm buying stuff in plastic packaging that I could make myself. So I've stopped buying pots of hummus and make all my own hummus. It's like about a third of the price. It's much nicer. It's really easy to make. Vegan mayonnaise is really easy to make. It's a, it is quick, you know, and it's, a, it's far cheaper. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of things we can do and grow our own food and uh, yeah. But, uh, but thank you so much, everybody, for, I think, bringing really quite a well-rounded perspective of how, you know, these, these, these different 
huge sort of systemic issues all interact and it can seem very daunting because there's so many problems and all of them are so huge but yet it really is about um in some way it seems to be about inner change about you know how we how we look at things how we view things and 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 in a way that action flows from a different perspective a different consciousness that uh, you know we, we we don't have to feel defeated we don't have to feel separated um we we need to identify as part of this um this amazing you know uh, uh, um, living planet of gaia that we are all we're all cells in the body of, of of the living planet and if we could have that consciousness i think a lot of these things would just kind of um flow naturally of course we have to think about you know about the the, the details of the issues but uh, um thank you so much and um I, <laughs> in the the webinar that we were in before there were there ended up being like 15 minutes for questions and there were 60 people in the webinar and it was like oh it's a bit of a shame but we've got a full hour so i want to hand over to um, the audience now so please feel free to put questions in the chat i'll try and monitor them but i'll also be watching for um hands going up uh, virtual hands real hands um i think i've still just about got you all on one screen so would anybody from the audience like to put a question or make a statement or or offer anything i know we've got some very knowledgeable people out there who'd like to start us off Uh, yeah, David Cundell, yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Shannon, I really agree with what you were saying about taking a global perspective. And, you know, you can think of people like Wangari Mathai, who a generation ago was planting trees in Kenya and, and changing the consciousness in, in that country. I just wondered whether one way of you know making it a bit doable for a city like leeds it would be to say to our city mothers and fathers why don't we twin with a city in india and a city in africa um and develop you know it will be middle class people largely who are the activists in those cities um, but, you know, we will learn so much and it, it could be a quite a, a doable thing, um, you know, because otherwise it's just so vast. And there are so many people from the diaspora, so many diasporas. I, at the moment, Nigeria is my main contact. But, you know, I think, David, you had a friend from Tanzania the other year, didn't you? And, and he was doing some really interesting stuff so that that might be one way in which we could maintain the global perspective but make it doable for a city that's my contribution yeah thanks very much what a great idea and um, actually i've been talking about this on a, a slightly different scale um earlier in the week we had a, a video from um a brilliant uh, a small charity in leeds called Mama Namatoto, which David, you'll know what that means, but it means mother and baby. It's a, um, a, a midwife, senior midwife in Leeds has set up this, this charity um, working in rural Kenya um, with a kind of holistic approach. So um, she'd been working with NGOs in Kenya previously and, and seen that they, they, they'd fallen down a lot because they all had, you know, specific sort of outcome that they were targeting that they got funding for. But then that would often be sabotaged by the fact that there were so many multidimensional problems that, that the people were facing that, you know, you, you solve one problem, but then it really doesn't go anywhere. So this is a tiny charity as an income of about 12,000 a year. And it's absolutely hugely improving the lives of hundreds and hundreds of women in this small rural community in Kenya. And I said, well, let's, let's twin you know a, a community in Leeds with that that community and we can you know talk to them over zoom and and, and, and really understand what these people's lives are, are actually like and how we can you can we can help them more effectively so I like to see that and, and, and maybe you could expand that yeah to 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 on a bigger scale to to Leeds 
running with um, somewhere like that as well. But uh, yeah, so we, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that, uh, that suggestion. Thanks very much, David. Anybody else? Yeah, that's JL. I, I just wanted to comment on the twinning idea. You know, the thing is the learning would be going, yeah, you know, from the partner to Leeds, wouldn't it? Because our consumption is four times that of a, uh, of, of any African, uh, you know, village uh, town that we would we would link with, and and you know maybe the learning th through that is how much we waste. You know, I I I I, um, I, I find that kind of um, an area where I'm really not sure people are aware of the level of waste that they they have. You know, they worry about the plastic bag, but not about the lettuce that was in it that was thrown away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I think with these sort of schemes, it, it often seems a little bit sort of, you get a sort of slightly post-colonial thing where, where you know, we're supposed to be bringing understanding, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, I, I really think the knowledge goes the other way. And I want to go back to what Shannon said about indigenous knowledge. You know, we have waited way too long you know, to actually recognize the importance of indigenous knowledge. If you look in Brazil, it is really critical. Uh, and other places in the world that I've worked in, in Borneo, you know, it, the indigenous people there are the people who understand the forest and could protect the forest. And, and yet they're the very last people to be involved in that protection. Uh, IPB uh, has recognized this and the, the recent work on biodiversity is, has set up a network of indigenous people to advise on biodiversity. But, you know, it is all very fragile because we're talking about the 20% of the world that is not seriously impacted at the moment. And so it really is critical that we do that. And I, I just want to acknowledge what Shannon said and, and, and say maybe those are the areas where we should, we should think as well of how we can increase our learning, you know, by, by twinning with that sort of area, um, rather than think of it as a, as a um, uh, more of a support, you know, a, a support that we're giving. It's, it's, a, it's an increase in knowledge for us. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Jay Owl, you had a question. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not as so much a question as an idea, and that is we need to get to the mindset where if we see areas of land that are not being used, we say, right, let's make them green, let's have a garden there, let's have vegetable plots there, let's get the community gardening, raising our own veg, cutting down the food miles, making food cheaper. I think that needs to be like the, the natural go-to whenever there's a spare plot of land now. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, again, um, there was a lot about that in our um, earlier um, event about um, food in Leeds, feed, feed Leeds and so on. Also, we, we had, a, um, I'm just mentioning these because um, all of the events uh, will be on the website to watch again. So and I think I said earlier that, uh, you know, it's not over now. Um, we, we also had, uh, Judith, uh, um, a, a very interesting presentation from Zero Waste Leads. So we're trying to promote that as well. <laughs> um, and, oh yeah, just before the next question, um, somebody had asked earlier about the, the Ecodharma course. I'm just going to put the link for that in the chat, chat right now. So the, for those who are interested. Okay, that's it there. And... Okay, so I'm just looking around for another question. Well, Shannon, you wanted to say something, yeah. Right, ahead. just, just the, um, for, uh, two, two short points on to um, both Judith and was it JL? Yeah, uh, yeah he just spoke. Um, just on, yeah, echoing what, what Judith was saying around this appreciation of, of knowledge coming from indigenous communities, um, just in particular was thinking about how um, uh, the seven generation principle of how indigenous communities think seven generations ahead um, before making any decision and how that would have really um, put us in better stead um, if we'd have implemented it sooner. Um, but would just also echo that um, we're really cautious to not um, see indigenous communities and the rest of the world as, as just an area to learn from and, and be really cautious around that extractivist kind of Western culture of like these people are here for, um, for us to learn from and to not give back. So I think it has to be, and at the minute we're failing in terms of the Paris Agreement has not um, given the global South, sorry, the majority world, um, bit of unlearning racism right there. Um, 
the majority world um, the financial support to make that transition. Um, the, the targets that were set under Paris were not enough anyway, um, even if you're not talking about reparations. Um, and, and so there's, you know, we need to make sure that that is a reciprocal re relationship um, for, for that to continue. Uh, and the only other point I was going to make was just on, on JL's point about um, it'd be great if that was the mindset and everyone was thinking about how do we um, use our new spaces. I think it definitely needs to happen. Um, just one learning point from, from Youth Strike as we kind of took to a new streets and started striking everywhere. Um, we got criticized a lot around um, not asking the communities about going into those spaces. And so I think that just needs to be re-echoed. Um, so we would shout things like our streets um, as a very uh, white youth movement. Um, and that didn't pay heritage to um, the generations of, of gentrification and how the streets were actually shared by all and often taken by white people by white people from uh, black and brown people so just i think just the the only point there would be making sure we're really conscious about engaging with communities as we're going into spaces and asking people um you know make sure it's a collaborative process as well but love the idea thanks very much um so uh, there's a question in the chat and um it's from Armine and it's been yeah um been suggested that I read that question out unless she does want to speak it. Okay, um, I'll read it out. The question was, how do you propose to, and this is, yeah, um, it looks like it's addressed to the panel, but I suppose it could be to anybody. How do you propose to increase the diversity within the movement, i.e. participation of disabled people and people from the BAME community? So, uh, yeah, still continuing on the same theme and in a really important question. Thank you. Anybody like to pick up that one? Um, go, go on, Judith, you go first. Yeah. I can't You're hear muted. you. <laughs> You've muted yourself again, Judith. <laughs> okay, I'll go. I, I, I've I'll got go dogs. I've got dogs. That's why I'm worried. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think somebody said it earlier. It might have been Shannon listen that that's the key to everything is listening to people it's the key to a lot more than just this conversation as well it's it's fundamental to the whole you know topic of this um you know this this week of compassion and if we can't listen to people we're not going to learn i think there's so many lessons to learn just by listening to people and asking them uh, about their lives and perspectives you know, uh, um, you know, li linking to um, animal rights and veganism, for instance, in school, I find an awful lot of the kids who, who are interested in climate change, uh, they they come to it because of their love of animals. And how often do we really, you know, tap into that? Um, sometimes we just we just start listening. We're not. In fact, there's a great example about a year ago. I was listening to radio for and they'd asked for vegans to phone in, and I can't remember the specifics of it all, but they kept asking these vegans about, you know, their experience. Many of them had started in the last six months, and they kept on referencing climate change and how worried they were about failing ecosystems. And the, um, the interviewer, the radio presenter, just couldn't hear it, just kept going on about animal rights and animal cruelty. Um, I wasn't listening to why people were becoming vegan in such large large numbers at that moment in time. Um, and you could extend that to all kinds of other areas, but I think if we listen to what people's concerns are, then we'll know how to address the climate and ecological crisis. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I couldn't agree more that, that listening is the key and um, you know, I mean, I, 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 as well as, I mean, I, I am a, a climate activist still, <laughs> I have been for a long time, but uh, the, the other thing that I'm passionate about and that my, most my whole life in one way or another is now all about is compassion. And I've found increasingly that is the absolute key if we can learn how to really listen. And that means, you know, um, getting out preconceived ideas out of the way like that interviewer you know had a preconceived idea about why people are vegans mm. they couldn't hear that people are saying there's another reason why we're vegans 
No. Um, so if we can get our preconceptions out of the way and really just be present and listen to what people are saying, it's a magic. It's a magical thing. Um, and that seems to be, you know, it's kind of coming more and more of a theme for me about everything, but you know, this as well. Um, okay. So we still have quite a lot of time and I'm encouraging you to, you know, put your ideas in the space. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to give the, the audience a bit more of a chance if there's anybody who's got anything they want to put in there. Go ahead, Judith. Yeah, yeah, we're still uh, people are listening. Oh no, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I mean, obviously for XR, this is an issue. XR is widely criticised as as being, you know, middle middle class white, uh, you know, in its composition, and you know, I, that's 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 true to an extent, but I, I, I it's, it's not true in reality if you look at uh, as as Shannon was saying at the international picture, because it, it it is actually an international organisation. But I, I, I think the challenge of, of kind of looking at this, you know, if you're going to have a nonviolent direct action as, as your platform uh, for, act, for activism, then, then that has challenges associated. In our last rebellion that is only just finished, you know, huge amount of work went into how we could be more inclusive. Uh, I guess other other groups here, other people here must have been through the same thing with their, uh, with their organizations. Um, and right from the beginning, you know, we, we, we sought to have intersectionality to work with other groups. So although these groups are not part of XR, we sought to bring them in and to try and, 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 uh, and, and uh, make a bridge. Um, and, you know, I mean, one of those is the multi-faith group, the Faith Bridge that brings all religions together. And they had a vigil, uh, a multi-faith vigil for the entire length of the, of the rebellion. Um, in Manchester, where I was, one of the key people there was uh, differently abled, and he ran a, a disability workshop to own inclusivity and how to how to encourage, you know, and enable people to take part in protest. But there's a vast amount of work, you know. Also online, you know, I count a hundred emails today on uh, the group that's looking at uh, at. Uh, uh, justice, social justice and climate justice, they're thought to be one thing in XR, but somehow it's difficult to weld those messages together. So I think it is, it's, a, it's a long journey, but it, it comes through, yes, listening, but I think as groups, it comes through intersectionality. It comes for us working with other groups and joining our aspirations. So the climate justice is not different from social justice. You know, we have to weld those things together. Nobody said this better than your opening speaker who talked about the way that we have to have a holistic view. Um, and that is what we have to do to be inclusive. We have to be holistic. So. Yeah, thank you, Judith, for just mentioning it because I, have, I haven't, uh, I don't think so anything about it, but if you haven't uh, seen Satish Kumar's opening speech, maybe I did mention it earlier, but do, do uh, go to the Watch Again section on the website. It is, um, yeah, it's really inspirational, and I think uh, there's there's a lot of deep content to it as well. Um, Yeezy spoke about uh, you know that that really um, three dimensions of compassion, if you like, you know, self compassion, very important. We need to look after ourselves as well. We need to kind of look after our spiritual well being, because otherwise, whatever we do. You know, um, if we're not well on that level, then whatever we do just doesn't really come from the right place. And then um, social compassion. We need to create a society where people are listened to and heard and cared about and, and, and uh, where we are sharing things more equally. And then compassion for the planet. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, I, I was... Uh, I mean, I love Satish. He's been one of my kind of heroes and, and, and personal friend and mentor for many years. But I thought he was really on his best form <laughs> last Sunday. So to do watch that. Anybody else like to offer any thoughts? I'm thinking we, we really should have planned a breakout session for this group. We, we didn't do that because I thought there would be, you know, so many questions and so much in the, in the big group that uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. But um, yeah, Shannon. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, it was just uh, following on from uh, from Judith's points, and also um, 
just something I was thinking about uh, before the event and the, the the word compassion and like why and and I guess like um digging into that a little bit and and why compassion and, and not something else or like how people take that as as a verb uh, and um, as an action um, and I guess the I've been reading recently I don't know if anyone. Um, has ever has ever read this book, but um, it's called All About Love by Bell Hooks. We've lost your audio there, Sharon, I think. Oh, apologies. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. I've also covered up the microphone. Apologies. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how much you heard. Uh, we missed the last sentence or so. Um, I was just going to say, I've been reading um, this book uh, called All About Love by Bell Hooks. And um, when I was thinking about compassion uh, uh and and i was like looking at what it means and i think uh for for me like the the word i think we have to uh or that i would um choose instead would be love um and partly the like how this book defines it because for me compassion is kind of opening up your heart and being sympathetic and listening to others so what like, the reason that i'm talking about this is what what judith was saying about the um, and, and Matt about the importance of listening to to others and, and to where they're coming from. Um, but I do also, I think I would tweak it slightly and say that um, I think compassion sometimes, depending on, on how we imagine it ourselves, can be passive and can be, we're just listening and taking it in and then not really doing much about it. Um, and I would just, yeah, so I would, I would say that um, when we are listening to communities, there is also this more active part, which I think is encompassed by this, this love um, and the will to kind of also act. Um, and I think when we're listening to other communities and other people, um, for example, as a group like XR, as a group like Youth Strike, um, we have to be aware that we have to make space for that. So um, a lot of people, when we're trying to uh, open up our space for more working class people, for example, we have to be aware that we have to create the space where they don't have a lot of time or don't have a lot of money. So you have to pay people for their labor in terms of coming to you and, and making those spaces. And I think that's, um, yeah, that would just be my, my follow on point. So I think we have to be more active as well um, and not just expect people to kind of come to us when we're listening. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I'm actually, thank you. And uh, people do understand compassion in different ways. And, and in the sort of, um, research about it at the moment that, that what's coming forward is um, an essential part of the definition of compassion as it's being talked about in you know um, where there's a lot of research being done on on how how significant it is for people's um, you know people's well-being both to give and receive compassion um, that an essential component is an active intention to to do something to, 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 to mitigate the suffering. But, but often just that kind of um, genuine listening um, does so much, you know, just by itself. But of course, uh, you know, if there's something that needs doing, then we have to do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I don't suppose I could uh, ask a question. It's a bit um, maybe different from the others. Um, but uh, say for people who, you know, a lot of people have had changes in work, obviously, with the last last few months. Um, but, you know, do you have any ideas that you think companies should be looking at more now with regards to the environment, with how they could change their businesses or for people who are setting up new businesses, what they should be more mindful of? Anybody would like to respond to it? It doesn't have to be one of the panellists, <laughs> if you've got any thoughts. Well, just, just to mention that um, um, Leeds Climate Commission does a lot of work with businesses, um, large and small, um, to help them to de decarbonise. The focus is, 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 that, you know, is fairly narrow, it's mostly decarbonising. Um, but if you go to the, the Leeds um, Climate Commission website, they've run courses and training series and they will um, find various kinds of support for, depending on what's appropriate for your business so it's worth looking for that okay 
Um, there was a related question actually that um, just prompted me to remember because I did promise Elizabeth that I would ask this question. Um, uh, it's from Elizabeth Pearson and the question is, we find ourselves in a new world following the recent pandemic with the growing pressures on the earth from climate change and the unpredictable forces of the changing weather patterns we're experiencing. How can we care more on a local level to safeguard our environment whilst benefiting ourselves, including our well-being? I'll put that in the chat so that you can, <laughs> it's quite a long question, but I'll, I'll put it in there, hold on. Okay. Uh, okay, that's Elizabeth's question. <laughs> Anybody got any thoughts on that? I mean, maybe I'll, I'll just say, say, say a word or two, because um, I've been thinking about this a lot, you know, that <clears throat> it's very interesting and kind of strange in a way that this quite bizarre situation has arisen at this very time when we seem to be right on the cusp of a tipping point in terms of climate. Um, and obviously it has slightly put the brakes on uh, the carbon emissions but not uh, not massively much less than I would probably have, have imagined but what it has done is it's given us a pause and we're going to have to when we when we come out of this pandemic situation um, it's like we're going to have to reboot the whole system it seems you know so many things are going to have to be revisited um, and and while it's been going on, there's been an e e extraordinary, seems to me, I don't know what other people's experience has been, an extraordinary kind of surge of activity of, of, of talking about, you know, over Zoom all the time, talking about, well, you know, like this conversation that we're having right now, you know, is part of that. But I've seen so many, you know, like big meetings with literally tens of thousands of people looking at these global issues. And I kind of wondering, you know, that maybe that's going to have some kind of a cumulative effect. And um, I don't know, you know, I've, I, a lot of the conversations I've been involved in have been hosted from overseas. And, you know, this is the biggest one really with just within Leeds that I've been involved in. But it does seem that um, all of that, you know, because, I mean, that, that we can kind of get hung up in, in as, as activists on, well, this is just another talk shop, you know. And of course, that sometimes is a valid criticism. But I do think that, um, you know, how else do we change? Uh, um, yes, we change. Of course, we change minds and hearts by actions, but also by our communication with each other and by um, some kind of collective space that we create. Um, there's, a, there's a, a teacher called Thomas Hubel who's very, very interesting on this. Um, you know, his, his work is on collective trauma healing. Um, and he's doing a lot of work now on climate change as well and, and, and how, how we can create this shift in consciousness that I spoke about earlier. And it has occurred to me to wonder if, you know, there's something um, quite important that is happening with this process where we're all kind of, you know, <laughs> Um, forced onto our screens to talk to each other across the world about these issues. Um, but what's going to come out of it? We don't know, of course, until, until we do come out of it. Um, but, I, you know, thank you for that question. Um, and that's what we've been, you know, the whole of this week with this festival, it really has been an attempt to respond to that question. How can we care more on a local level to safeguard our environment whilst benefiting ourselves, including our well-being, ourselves and each other, of course. Um, yeah, so that's just a very vague woolly thought, I think, but maybe, um, yeah, Shannon, do you want to come in on that one? Thank you, David. Um, I, I thought, um, I didn't think it was woolly at all, actually. I thought it was um, it's a really <laughs> great thing to touch on. Um, I was just thinking about this, um, just COVID and uh, this idea of caring for each other. Um, and I don't know about anyone else, but the, the kind of two big takeaways that I've took from, you know, this, this past six months and, and everything that, that it's brought um, has been I guess a renewed focus on uh, public health 
and um, the, the importance of health being uh, a red line, a starting point, um, you know, should be there for, for everyone um, and, that, and how um, that is ultimately the, the front line. So fighting for, for health of everyone. Um, and the other thing is, uh, is mental health. So with COVID, I think it's been a lot of time for reflection and, and learning, particularly within the activist community, um, which I think sometimes is in the business of doing without reflecting on, on what we're doing uh, a lot of the time. So I think that's been really valuable. Um, but for a lot of people, it has, you know, kickstarted a, a very real mental health crisis, um, and which is which is underway, and not everyone has access to services. Um, and I think on both of those points, I think uh, they're they're really important. And I think one of the in relation to public health, I think the the climate movement, um, and as uh, people, everyday activists, everyday people, um, trying to spread care and compassion is making the link between public health and and the climate stuff and so i would just i wanted to share um this brilliant report which has just come out around that it links up um the importance of acting on both fronts right now uh, in response to covid19 um and then the other thing was um around mental health and i think we've got a really uh, long way to go with that and i don't know what um, matt's reflections on this are particularly working with young people but that's been a real concern for me because people are saying that here in the uk nothing's um, happening right now in terms of climate change because we have, you know, physically. Um, but I would say we, uh, there's a lot of problems with young people's mental health around this already. And that's the start of it um, without kind of any natural disasters or extreme weather events and, and things like that. So, um, and I think one of the uh, action areas for that in relation to climate and the environment movement is uh, this idea of resilience, um, you know, we have to reduce our carbon, but we also have to change our communities and become more resilient. Uh, even in the UN kind of definition of uh, resilience action right now and how cities can become more resilient and adapt their communities, there is no mention about preparing communities um, and people in terms of their mental health for dealing with um, not only the climate anxiety, which I think very much underplays the kind of depressive symptoms that that brings, which also means that we're unable to act because our mental health is not okay. Um, but you've also got very real trauma events which will be happening in terms of, um, you know, extreme weather events, uh, flooding, things like that, people losing a lot. Um, and, and, and I can't even put that into words. My language doesn't, you know, you can't... Um, I've never lost my house to a flood and I've never lost family um, to any of that, but they're re very real trauma events and we are not preparing young people. We're not preparing any of any of our communities in terms of our mental health and capacity to deal with that. And I think, yeah, so in terms of care, I, I just, I feel like public health and linking the two and framing the climate and, and the environmental movement within a public health narrative um, is really needed and the other thing is is making sure that we are talking about mental health as an essential um part of where do we go from here how do we embed that into everything that we do make sure people are prepared and and are healthy mentally as well as physically yeah once again thank you Shannon I, I couldn't agree more and I think you know <laughs> it's not a, a an impending pandemic it's a pandemic that's been around for a long time and it's been in worsening for many years um, uh, in my opinion this is the real pandemic is the mental health situation in our society um, so thank you for spotlighting that um, yeah and uh, it's something that will be central to our work going forward in Compassion and Wellbeing 2020. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yes, Matt, please. Yeah, I'm muted again. <laughs> Can't hear you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> so yeah, I will, I will respond to Shannon's kind invitation to say something about, especially about schools. But this feeds really into, for me, the whole way we conduct ourselves um, in, in the climate movement. Um, but yeah, we, we're starting to see uh, more and more real effects of um, children and young people being really anxious about their future. And they're already in a mental health crisis situation. You know, 
in, in our sixth form, um, it's a very typical kind of sixth form, we expect about 20% uh, um, of our sixth form students to, in our sixth form, to, to be diagnosed with some kind of mental health problem. Mm -hmm. And those, that's just the diagnosed ones, you know. So th there's a huge range of factors that feed into that. But climate anxiety and eco-anxiety, as I think this term has caught on now, um, is an additional burden along with all the other concerns that people have. And that for me ties very much again into this theme of compassion, because I think we've got to be really careful about how we talk about the future and how we talk about the dangers. Whilst telling the truth, we need to make sure that our messaging doesn't feed into, um, you know, ramping up people's fears and worries unnecessarily and that is a huge project in itself you know just take one really simple narrow little question which i've been working on supporting the um leeds development education center on which is about if you imagine what children should be taught about climate change across key stages one to four then what do you teach them and when if you address that kind of question compassionately you have to really seriously think about what it's okay to tell children at different stages and you have to make sure that you balance um, the scary stuff with opportunities to envision uh, a, a kind of future that is livable and where they can thrive and think about how they get there and involve them in the process and, and give them empower them with ways of responding that are meaningful um, so just with one simple question like that, the curriculum, the school curriculum, um, we've got to be really careful to think about where we're coming from in terms of our own fears. And, I, and I, I've made this mistake many times and I, I think I'm on a, on a journey learning about this, but I suggest that, um, you know, fear is, is absolutely natural and normal. We can't avoid it. But acting on climate from a place of fear is um, a kind of lower path than coming from a place of compassion. And I would compare it to what Gandhi said about violence and nonviolence in direct action. Um, he, he said that violence was preferable to doing nothing, which a lot of people don't realise but that non-violent you know because he, he was so aware of the huge problems that come with violence with acting violently um so of course he dedicated his life to non-violence which is a kind of stage beyond violence really if you, if you frame it the way that he did um of understanding the risks and the harms but um putting your own self in harm's way in order to achieve peaceful change and i think perhaps in the climate movement we need to think in terms of um rather than violence and non-violence or in a similar way fear and compassion okay. um the, you know fear is natural fear is normal fear is going to be a lot of people's basic response but if we can move beyond fear and act from a place of compassion then we will be able to find um the hope that we that we need which is a word i far prefer to optimism um and and be able to uh, get alongside people and make a better world whatever the the outcome for me personally uh, a really helpful moment in my life when i was really struggling emotionally with with climate change and and what the direction things seem to be heading in was reading an article in ecologist magazine um written by Rowan Williams, who at the time was Archbishop of Canterbury. And it was very, very simple. I can't tell you how he expressed it. But what, what stayed with me was, he said, well, look, e even if the world does become a harder place to live in, and um, there is great suffering, we can still behave more or less compassionately with each other. We can still make life worth living by being caring people. 
And I think if we have that at the heart of everything we try to achieve in terms of the climate and ecological crisis, uh, very much, you know, I'm thinking very much in terms of the climate justice in particular, then um, however far we do get, however successful or unsuccessful we are, we will have made the world a better place anyway. Thank you, Matt. That's very eloquent. <laughs> and we call this, we, 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 I'd say we changed the title of this event, we called it Climate Emergency Compassion Emergency. And I think you've really summed up the, the purpose of why we're, you know, why we're holding this event as part of a Compassion Festival. Um, so thank you for that. So Judith, maybe, yeah, um, uh, after Judith speaks, I, I'd really like to sort of encourage the rest of the audience we'd like to hear you know so your your perspective i know we've, we've had some really eloquent and and deep contributions from from the panel but i'd like to encourage a bit more involvement if we can we've still got uh, uh, 20 minutes so yeah judith do you want to just um, oh, I'll, I'll be brief i mean i think i just wanted to have yeah for me what was a moment of hope so I, I, I think what I noticed, um, you know, during the pandemic and that a lot of bad things have happened, you know, the, the random numbers we are and aren't allowed to uh, meet in, the fact that people are shielding, you know, my neighbour included, have seen nobody, you know, for months, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of pressure and a lot of challenges to us socially. Um, but what I notice is I live next to a park and over the period of the pandemic, more and more people, and it's a diverse group of, of people, people from all sorts of backgrounds are coming out in the park, coming with their families, uh, sometimes coming just as a couple to walk through. And I think nothing but good can come of that because it's encouraged people instead of, you know, taking the kids in the car to uh, a mall or somewhere to do some shopping, you know, you actually take them for a walk in the park. Uh, so many more people riding bicycles, teaching their kids to read bicycles. Um, older people that I haven't ever seen walk out, perhaps because of the l lack of traffic, walking out, coming through into the community orchard. This is connecting people back to nature um, and that has enormous healing power for us. And I think that was felt by people during the pandemic. So that's my moment of hope that maybe it's just shown us there's another way. You know, if you slow down, if you take time, uh, the slow day you referred to, the slow Sunday you referred to earlier, you know, the day when you're just with your family, those things are, are now more precious to us. And maybe that's going to help us in the turning point. Yeah, very good. Thank you. OK, so now's your moment, everybody. <laughs> I'm really going to encourage you. You know, you're here. You've all got something to say. We'd, we'd like to hear from you. Does that kind of... I, I notice this in Zoom meetings that there's that sort of hesitation. <laughs> okay. David, maybe you'd like to just comment on, because you put something in the chat there, and, and I think that's quite quite significant. Um, would you like to just uh, expand on that a bit? Well, I was, I suppose, ended up echoing a bit of what Judith has just said. Um, but the question that you uh, read out was implying that um, the pandemic was past and it's sadly only just starting and uh, we're, we're in for you know as far as the pandemic is concerned we're in for a couple of really grim years um, but you know what I then said was rather like Judith has just said the the responses that we've seen in the first phase have been very encouraging you know, there's been an assumption that you know we we would behave in a very selfish way, and in fact, you know, countrywide, uh, people have behaved in a very compassionate and caring way, and it's brought out the best of it, best in us. Um, and you know, social psychologists um, know that actually that's that's what people tend to do in a crisis. Um, people assume that we'll be self-centered but actually uh, we haven't been and and if you know i share matt's views about the danger of the word optimism although i think i am an optimist um so I, you know i think we've seen you know one thing the pandemic has shown is that that we are compassionate people and you know if we bring the same spirits to the much bigger crisis uh, then you know there is 
there is hope. Thanks very much. And I've seen a couple of questions I've missed in the chat. Um, I wonder, Elizabeth, would you like to um, speak your question <laughs> about the farmers and landowners, or shall I read that out? I'm not sure if Elizabeth's actually there, so I'll read this question out. How can we listen more and work with our own farmers, landowners, environment caretakers to understand what their concerns are at a local level in Leeds? and what is happening. Would anybody either from the panel or the audience like to comment on that question? I think it's an important question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm afraid I'm not going to answer it very helpfully and directly, but, but just to welcome it as a question because I think so often we hear about um, cities and it's, there's an incredibly urban kind of focus about dealing with the climate and ecological emergency. Um, I think that's especially prevalent in um, a way of thinking called eco-modernism, which, um, you know, in many ways we've, we've already started um, lots of eco-modernist projects and some of them are quite beneficial, but there's a, I think there's a grave danger in eco-modernism that we make the assumption that um, you know, the the rural is only really there um, to support cities. And I think that's a, something we really need to be very careful about, um, that we, just as we need to make sh sure that, you know, the uh, majority world is not only really there to support um, the, those countries that are already very wealthy. So, um, yeah, just to welcome the question from that point of view, um, that you know cities are not the be all and end all yeah thank you Matt. it reminds me actually um back in 2006 when um uh i was started a, a, an organization called sustainable futures leads and we, we had the um series of schumacher lectures on sustainable cities and there was a very interesting man who spoke there called Ezio Manzini, a professor of sustainability studies from from italy um and um, in his workshop, um, I, I, I don't know, maybe it was in a conversation outside the workshop actually. Um, and I remember him saying, you know, to, in response to something I'd said, oh, surely nobody thinks that we're going to have more people moving out of the cities and living, you know, think that that's a good idea, people moving out to rural areas. And I said, well, I think it's a good idea. And I, in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a talk, uh, an amazing talk actually that I saw recently on YouTube by Thich Nhat Hanh, check it out. Uh, you'll find it if you see, if you search uh, Thich Nhat Hanh um, on um, ecolog ecological collapse. It's one of the best talks. I think it's the best talk I've ever heard on climate change, actually. But he's advocating that. He's saying we need to we need completely different kind of communities than what we have at the moment. Not that those communities can't exist in cities, but they more naturally exist in in, you know, in rural settings where you have a community where people are genuinely connected. You know, it's a human scale community where everybody knows everybody and, um, you know, um, like the community that he's created himself in, in, in southern France at one village. Um, and I thought it was very interesting, you know, he really was saying in, in, in that talk, which I do urge you to, to, to find out, to, 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 to check out, um, we, we, we want to be moving away from these kind of mega, you know, living environments, reconnect with the countryside and, uh, you know, create a kind of life, a simpler lifestyle that is more in tune with our, our basic nature as, you know, as what we are as, as you know, biological organisms. We're not machines, you know. We, 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 we live in a, 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 um, a world where, to a great extent, uh, has been designed, um, increasingly it's been designed by machines and I mean, for machines, and we have been, been treated as if we were human beings are being treated as if they're machines in a lot of ways in the thinking. And I wonder if, you know, we will see a return. I think, you know, I've, I've been thinking this for many years that um, because we have, you know, uh, energy intensive technology that can do our farming for us. So then we, you know, um, 
we, we don't need to have so many people on the land and so rural communities is are underpopulated, urban communities are overpopulated, the agricultural system is ecologically destructive um, because it's mechanized and chemicalized um, and we need to slow down, get back to the land. <laughs> There's some thoughts. Um, Angela, yeah, please do, yeah, speak your question. I saw your question in the chat, thank you, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick up a little bit more what you said David just offer some kind of reflections more than anything else of what I'm hearing and um, and it yeah for, I'm Angela Green I'm one of the um, co-founders of the um, kindness revolution living here in Leeds um, yeah and I'm particularly kind of as one of the original co-founders of this kind of um, movement I suppose in terms of kindness compassion and well-being is that we based kind of one of our kind of main principles around the idea of practice and the practice of like relationships so you know in terms of climate you know we've the we've got lots of different types of relationship we have the inner relationship that we have with ourselves our head body mind how we react and that's the source of much of our fear and and then how we relate to others how we live, relate to community how we relate to but one of the thing we've completely become more increasingly distant is our relationship to the planet you know so there's something about how can you know in our education system it kind of that practice of relating to ourselves in a kind compassionate way relating to others in a kind compassionate way but creating the space to um, develop nurture and practice the relationship that we all have with the planet you know it, it's about that understanding that everything we do every breath we take have every action that we um, kind of do in the world has an impact on the planet and that we're not separate from the planet you know it's this and i think the whole kind of technology the structures the systems the the way we work um it's just you know that's completely like gone off the radar that we're in this relationship with ourselves we're in a relationship with others and we're in a relationship with a planet and um it's how do we get create the spaces to sit and explore the relationships we have with the planet you know and where's the learning you know that not only like about what we're taking from the planet but what the planet's giving us you know there's something really like looking at it as a uh we're in balance with the planet you know um type of thing and yeah i just wanted to share that really but thank you yeah, thanks very much, Angela. And, and that's a great question. You know, how can we create spaces where we can um, come together to explore and, and develop that relationship? So we'll, we'll keep that in mind. And Shannon, other Shannon has a question or a, a, a comment. Shannon calls here. Yeah, it's a comment really about what Angela just said. Um, and it, it was something that happened that I started to think about when I was spending time with my uh, with my niece. I spent a day with her. She runs an early years um, forest school in her um, big back garden. And we were talking about the the way that the children there, the tiny little children, um, the, their behavior and their, their very deep interaction with 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 the with nature, with the with the with the garden and the things that are happening with the garden, which is a very wild garden, um, was very much the behaviour of, of, of attached children. And it, um, uh, we've been thinking and talking about this need for, to develop that attachment, uh, which is very much like attachment to, to, uh, to other people and that those children who are mm. attached to, to, to the natural world, um, will of course inevitably have to um, have to face um, what's happening to the climate but if they're facing it from a position of attachment 
is very much back to what Matt was talking about in terms of it being a position of of of, of strength and the and the desire for 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 change rather than the position of fear. Just a comment really on. On, on, yeah. on where I think education should be going, certainly the education of, well, of all children, but particularly of those younger children. Yeah, thanks very much. And I think Satish Kumar would agree very strongly with that, uh, you know, that uh, we, we really need to think about, um, from, from, from the word go with children, um, building a relationship that, you know, supporting them and, and uh, enabling them to build a relationship with nature that is healthy and based on on, on a, a love and an understanding of, of, of the natural world. So yeah, other Shannon, just briefly, and we're, we're, yeah, we've, we're coming to the end now, but uh, thank you so much for all your questions. Yeah, Shannon. It was just, um, uh, just yeah, extending that to, um, uh, like uh, I really loved Angela's word practice and like like the practice and the cultivation of um, of these relationships and being in like seeing ourselves in relation and but just extending this need to engage youth with that but also extend um, extending that to adults so one of the highlights of COVID for me has been uh, going back to my hometown and um, we live on a back-to-back -to -back all concrete and we started growing some stuff and um, I cannot pass on I don't think I don't think the excitement from when we got our first radishes has been matched by anything else um yeah. in in my life and and the, I'm my dinner tonight is some potatoes that I've grown outside and I, it's this um you know age of 24 and learning that and being amazed by <laughs> the planet's giving and and that has been um yeah a six-month process and it's been beautiful and um yeah I think as adults we need to uh, you know, provide that as well. So. I think your microphone's muffled again, David. All right, yeah. Oh, it's on the side here, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> somebody asked for the link for the talk by Tiknat Han. I've just put that in the chat. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Shannon. Um, yeah, couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, so we have and just that, that, that brings us, you know, back to some of the inequalities again, doesn't it? You know, my, well, I have a nice big garden, and my kids have been out there loads during lockdown, and they they love nature, you know, and they're always out in nature. Um, but that those that opportunity wasn't available to loads of people in our society yeah. recently. But it does remind me, Shannon's story reminds me of a brilliant project in Leeds um, several years ago called the uh, Back to Front Back Project. To front. Yeah. Um, Roxana Phillips, working with the health service, um, had um, found funding for people with just a little bit of space outside the house, um, very often uh, in the front of the house and covered in concrete to get um, raised beds put in and start growing food um, or whatever they wanted to grow in the front. And it generated community because people passing by would go, oh, what are you growing? And then they'd want to have a go and they'd want to get advice. Um, and it made growing your own stuff, especially food, into something that was more accessible and that lots and lots of people wanted to do. Um, so that's a good example of the sort of project, I think, isn't it, that can really be transformative. That's great, yeah, and that's the pro, pro project's been going for more than 10 years now. It's still going. Shannon's just put the link in the chat for Back to Front. Yeah. Um, brilliant. Um, I'd like to finish just a couple of minutes early because um, we have our final event of the Kindness Revolution Leeds Compassion Festival, and we were thrilled um, that we were able to get um, Kim Ledbeater, who is Joe Cox's sister, to close the, 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 the festival. So she's the founder of the Joe Cox Foundation. She's doing fantastic work. So I encourage you, if you're able to do that, to, to hang on, hang in there for another 20 minutes to hear uh, Kim's closing speech to the festival. But I'd just like to say a huge thank you to all the panel and all of the audience, including those that have already left. <laughs> it is getting late, um, but it's been a brilliant, uh, you know, uh, uh, really dynamic discussion and, and um, 
we will continue to use all of these videos to try and you know highlight these issues so um thank you so much everyone for taking part um and yeah uh we will continue this conversation <laughs> So yeah, we can do the, the traditional um, Zoom Zoom goodbye. You can all unmute yourselves and we can say thank you and goodbye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Thanks, folks. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs>